Okay, right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well. Welcome to another one of the Friday WSA webinar sessions. Um, this one this evening is all about uh, SUP surfing, and it's an introduction and a, a beginner and a slight improver level. That's what we're aimed at. Um, we will aim to have the webinar running for approximately an hour. Um, questions and answers, um, please fire those through the chat uh, function on your laptops or phones, whatever you're using. Um, I'll, I will try and um, get to answer or pass those to the panelists and see if we can answer them all in the given time. If we don't, I apologize for that, but um, you can always contact us via info at waterskillsacademy.com um, for further information as well. So we have two excellent panelists tonight. I'm going to hand over to, you, to them in a minute. We've got Andy Campbell from North Wales, avid sub surfer. I'm, I'm sort of more, more west actually, Chris. Just so no one gets <laughs> That's a good start. I've upset the apple cart there. So, yeah. um, just, just one thing as well I forgot to mention before we start. Um, there is a mute button on the left, bottom left of, of my screen, and it will be on most of yours, I would imagine. If you could make sure you hit the mute button um, so that we don't have any background interference, obviously, with the panellists. Um, you know how it works. Um, so we've got Andy from West Wales. Uh, just to clear that one up, and we have Marie, and I will also be chipping in on this webinar as well. I've got a little bit of experience of sup surfing and an awful lot of experience of surfing. So feel free to send through the questions. Um, I'm just going to hand you over now to Andy. So a few quick words, Andy. Um, introduce yourself and let us know how long you've been surfing. Um, how you just really just a few quick words, and then we'll crack on. Okay, cool. So yeah, so. Um, I moved to the west, uh, west coast of Wales when I was 10. Uh, I've always been a massive fan of the sea, even though I grew up in Sheffield, which is obviously absolutely miles away from the sea. Um, right here, just growing up, getting smashed around on the shore break on a bodyboard, you know, you sort of, um, I think you fall in love with it. You either hate or you love the sea with that. But, um, you know, obviously I fell in love with it. So, you know, bodyboarding, skimboarding, surfing, um, Anything I could really do, not not so much uh, wind sports, but mostly um, wave wave orientated sports. Um, a lot of skateboarding as well, which obviously crosses over from surfing. Um, did a lot of downhill mountain biking. Um, had to give that up because couldn't really afford it and the injuries and and everything else. And bought sold my bike, bought a paddleboard, and of course the first thing I did was take it surfing. Um, and I really liked the fact that it was it was a different way of surfing, different way of thinking towards surfing uh, from from your you know your average board. And you think you can just go and catch a wave and it's a piece of cake, but actually chucking these bigger boards around is much harder. And you have to use different parts of your body. And obviously the paddle is quite a key part. So sort of fell in love, I guess, with um, that different way of surfing. But I mean, for me, waves, any board, I'm I'm pretty happy. Um, and I suppose that pretty much sums me up. <laughs> Uh, an avid sub surfer in, as, in any opportunity that you can at the minute, then and he had loud back in the water now, so that's great. Yeah, um, exactly. So yeah, yeah. Apart from his flats, so, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that, um, Marie. Over to you. If you could just introduce yourself to our to our participants, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Hi there. Good evening. Um, I'm Marie. Um, I live in South Devon. Um, I haven't got a surfing background like Andy. Um, I grew up by the sea and I'm um, an avid windsurfer and I, I learnt to windsurf um, and I did a lot of sailing um, through my childhood um, and uh, really took up surfing when I on my first time I tried paddle boarding, um, which was a big break, it was ankle sized waves. Um, and I think catching my first wave on a sup was, you know, standing up was really what got me hooked. You know, I, I don't think there's anyone out there that's um, caught a wave on a, on a sup or caught any sort of wave on anything who, you know, it hasn't put a smile on their face. And I, I really like um, the part of sup where you get immersed, you know, to me it is a water sport and the best part of it is, um, falling in and getting wet, you know, every time I fall in, I get, it, it makes me laugh. So, um, you know, I think straight away I was hooked um, on the surfing aspect. And, um, you know, you may or may not know my background is um, in SUP is racing. Um, 
and I found that the skills that I picked up from SUP surfing, um, I started in 2007 um, and pretty much took up racing and surfing um, competitively from the very start. Um, and, you know, the transferable skills from surfing to the racing and especially racing in the ocean environment, of course, um, has, you know, really you know, really been useful for me. And uh, I think that's where I've managed to, you know, uh, get ahead of the perhaps, girl, you know, other girls that have been uh, landlocked or, um, you know, perhaps not ocean paddlers. Um, and, you know, the transferable skills uh, run through to downwind paddling, um, you know, technical racing, and I race in and out through the surf as well. So, you know, I don't, only surf on short boards I, I surf on race boards and I think the whole lot put together it just you know um is makes the sport really really interesting um yeah so that's me well thank you very much Maria and, and just for the panelists if, if you if you are interested um and the participants um so a little bit about my background is I've uh, been running a a water sports centre in Harlem Bay Padstow Cornwall started off as a surf school um, 25th year this year, not quite sure what's going to happen with the celebrations. Um, avid surfer, fortunate enough to travel pretty much around the globe, shall we say. Quite a few places left still to visit. Um, surfing for 40 years plus, giving me age away now. And also sup surfing since 2008. So I think between the three of us, we should be able to pass on a few, few tips for you guys. And like I say, fire the questions through. So, Marie, um, you, you said transferable skills. Um, we, you know, obviously, those people that are into racing and, and it involves boy turns, we, we, we know we're going into a SUP surf stance for there. So, um, all of those skills that you, you learned, picked up from SUP surfing, um, there's no doubt would have helped you when it comes to the, the dreaded boy turn, shall we say. Yeah. Um, and, and Andy, you said you, you went straight into the water, got your first SUP board, and, and off you went. So, yeah. For the purpose for the purpose of our, our, our audience, um, I mean, obviously, I think we should tackle this now for, in a kind of like a, a really good starting point would be, in my opinion, is let's talk about the safety, first of all, before people just jump into the water. Excuse me, Andy, um, but I know you've got a lot of, a lot of water experience. Um, but let's just kick off with a few safety tips maybe that we could give our audience um, so starting with possibly, I would say, um, the conditions. What, what, in your opinion, Marie, would, is an ideal kind of condition for our people looking to get into um, sup surfing? Kind of a break and, and what kind of waves and, and what do they need to consider? Um, yeah, I mean, I started off um, on a beach break. Um, you know, we're lucky here. We've got um, Bantham, which is my local. It's, it's a sort of um, gentle sloping beach um, which produces sort of gentle waves generally depending on what st state of tide it is um, and that makes it you know easier to um, launch and land um, safely um, you've got to remember that the SUP board compared to you know conventional surfboard or you know soft foamy is quite a big thing and, and can you know cause some damage if you don't uh, respect it and, and pick the right conditions for you when you're learning so um, I think you know it's really important that you you uh, don't don't sort of over challenge yourself to begin with and you go out in something that's um, you know not too challenging at, at first you just want to uh, you know try and um, pick up a wave it doesn't really matter what um, you know it doesn't need to be <laughs> big sort of powerful waves at all I think it's just the action of you know um getting your feet in the, uh, the uh, surf stance um and you know the, the paddle stroke is entirely different you, you it's a lot more sort of rapid cadence um to try and and it's all about timing um and I think you, you just need some small sort of you know two foot <laughs> waves um away from the main break yeah <laughs> I, I think uh, the message is, if in doubt, don't go out, the classic yeah. cliche, um, which is pretty apt at the minute, since our uh, beaches are not lifeguard patrol. Um, Andy, anything that you, you want to add, uh, add to that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, you know it's the, the conditions, obviously, looking at the forecast and, 
maybe getting some local knowledge because you know there's some breaks um that i know that when the tide gets low it gets very it gets a bit more aggressive um so trying to get a bit of local knowledge on maybe on the break uh but yeah definitely small you don't want anything too steep or you know um you don't want something that's going to be dumping you on the beach as well so i've <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, no one's really experienced it, but I've seen quite a few videos where people are obviously trying to get back in on their knees and they're literally getting slammed onto the shore um, on a big sup. So, you know, if it's just breaking right onto the beach, then yeah, that's the, you're not going to be able to catch it and do anything. Um, nice no. mellow type of wave. Um, again, that's not going to be a massive battle to get out and a nice clean beach without rocks um, sticking out, you know, so you're not having to, you know, look out for the rocks, you're not going to end up on them because a lot of people when they first start tend to not really know which way on the beach they're drifting. Um, so if there are rocks, you could well be drifting with them with the tide and not know about it. So just a nice clean open beach, nice gentle waves, because these boards will catch small waves, you know, these bigger boards will catch small waves. So you don't need anything uh, too big or aggressive at the start. So I, th I think there, um, Andy, is the key one is avoid that shore break. If, if we were to, if we if if we were to maybe have three or four really important tips, I mean, one thing you mentioned there was assess the beach on all stages of the tide if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, like you say, on a low tide, it could be um, rocks exposed. Um, we need to know where they are. Are we going to use a lifeguard patrol beach? Well, prefer preferably yes. Um, but the black and white flags um, can be quite a congested area. So a key point I think as well when you're starting is try to find space. Don't think that we're gonna be out um, having right amongst all the surfers because it's not really gonna be too good. Um, you also mentioned, Andy, um, looking at the charts. Now, for those of us who know what you're talking about there, what, what sources of information are you using to assess whether it's appropriate for you to go um, sub surfing? Uh, yes, yeah, so I suppose sort of um, magic seaweed, or we like to sort of call it magic lyre, but um, magic seaweed is a um, can be a good one. Um, you know, years and years ago, there was no there was no forecast like this to tell you when there was going to be waves, when it was going to hit, when it was going to finish. You sort of looked, there's going to be strong winds, there's a low pressure coming in, there's going to be waves, so we've got to take time off to try and get in. Where now you can almost, um, within reason say yeah okay so the wave's going to be too big in the morning but actually in the afternoon they're going to be dying off so things like magic seaweed can be a, a good one to show um i personally use the local boys in the area so um down off uh, pembrokeshire there's a couple of boys so we where we are we tend to see the swell coming up from the south um so we can actually see if that jumps up that this is going to feed back our way so if you've got any local boys or, you know, the local sort of wave boys or weather boys in the area um, to tap into. And then things like XC and Met Office, probably, just so you can see the wind directions and see the changes. So any, any um, kind of winds to avoid? Would, what would you say would be the... Obviously, we know a strong offshore wind would be probably not advisable. No, that would uh, be a bit of a nightmare to catch waves as well. <laughs> Yeah, and at the same time, a, a strong off onshore wind, so the wind's blowing from the sea onto the onto the beach, that is also going to make it challenging because yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to be relentless conditions. Um, so ideally, conditions for for, for beginning with, with what's, what wind conditions would you say would be ideal? Um, well, I mean, again, if you've got slight onshore, so up to sort of 10 mile an hour, I mean, it depends on the beach as well, but if it's slight onshore, the, the way I always think is onshore is always going to blow you back home. Offshore is going to blow you away from home. So if you get tired or if things go a little bit wrong, onshore is going to take you back. But of course, it's going to be much trickier to get out. The waves usually a bit closer together. Um, but I mean, the lightest winds you can get away with, but we always have to have some sort of wind, it seems, especially in the UK to get waves because they tend to seem to generate them, especially on the, the smaller beaches. And um, you, me you mentioned um, about speaking to other people, other locals, and finding out um, what the conditions are like. Um, you know, there's many, many different types of surf breaks around the UK, as we know. Um, the beach where I operate my surf school is um, 
probably not very appropriate for subsurfing on the low tide because it breaks really close to shore and the waves are quite steep. But then it changes very differently um, as the tide comes in. So a knowledge of tides is key. Um, and a knowledge of tides can come from uh, using our tide tables. So I don't know about you, Andy, up in your area, um, what is the tidal range that you, you would expect? you would um, experience up there compared to down here in Cornwall we you know the highest tides we can get are 7.9 meters um what, what, what about the effect up on up in your area um I think probably on the biggest tides you're sort of talking around six uh, meters down to about sort of maybe half a meter but it's not very often they're pretty slow tides where we are probably because of where we sit in Wales we're sort of like right here where you'll get um, the tides will expand, obviously, once you start getting further south and north. Um, so where we are, the, the tides, again, they, they, the waves tend to break better uh, with the tide going out uh, because you've got the tide against the swell. So it will steepen the waves up a little bit um, and they'll break it a little bit earlier than later. So for you, sorry, Andy, so, so for you Marie, um, where, where you're located in Bantham, um, so it's a lifeguard patrol beach, that's correct, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah, normally. Not at the moment. Um, no, not at the moment. Um, pretty busy beach as well? Yeah, very busy. Because it's really the only surf break locally on the south coast. So, you know, the next one's being, you know, pretty much in Cornwall. So it does get very busy, um, you know, whenever there's south coast surf. Um, so that's why, you know, it, it's really important that you, um, you know, assess the situation before you go out and really just see um, where the, the, the break, if you look on the webcam on Magic Seaweed, it gives you a good indication of um, where the main break is. It's actually called main break. Um, and that's where all the, 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 the local surfers um, tend to hang out. And that's obviously not the best place to um you know, learn, learn, take your board out for your first surf, surf uh, session. <clears throat> you know, you want to stay out of the way of all the all the surfers, really. Um, but um, yeah, sorry, I've forgotten your question now. <laughs> oh, just um, just, some, just uh, an expansion on some top tips, really. So we 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 talked briefly about tides. I mean, that's a whole different subject in itself. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about magic seaweed as a reference um, and the wind forecast. Key things. Um, asking locals, uh, local knowledge and assessing your beach on all different stages of the tide. Um, I'm, I don't know what your tidal movement is like in, in Bantham, but it's, um, um, like I said. Yeah, it's similar to um, where Andy is in Wales, um, range-wise, um, but it yeah. definitely has a, you know, a, a different effect. There's, there are strong rips um, that go out there on a spring tide. Um, particularly if there's been a lot of water running because it's, it's connected with the river Avon that yeah. runs out. So if there's been a lot of heavy rain, for example, then the currents uh, and, you know, wind, um, then the currents and the rip can be, you know, quite severe. So, you know, it's worth being aware of that and really perhaps picking um, stages of the tide where, you know, it's not fast flowing, um, but slack at either end. Um, Bantham tends to be gentler and kinder in the high tide section. So, um, you know, I always think that it's, I try and go out on my suck when it's high tide because the waves are very gentle then. Um, yes. Um, it's, you know, so, so I think we've covered, we've covered some basic safety things. They're essential. Um, just, just, a, just, really. a, just a, a quick thing, Chris. Um, I mean, you may bring this up, but it's, it's one thing that I've definitely found with um, a lot of newer um, surfers is, you know, we want you ideally to go on a, a bigger expanded beach, you know, just so you've got more room to stay away from people. But a real, real key point is when you're standing on the beach is pinpoint where you think you want to be. When you get out there, have a look back at the shore to see where you've just come from. Yeah. Because it is unbelievable, it's amazing in some places, places like Fresh West that I surf, I know it pretty well, but you know, when I first started surfing there, you'd look and think, what? But you've been here for half an hour, I'm miles away from where I started, you know, and that, again, with the rocky outcrops and whatever else, it's amazing how quick, when you're catching waves, that can actually catch you out, that you're actually drifting a long way. Maybe, maybe it's pulling to the left and you're only catching lefts, so you're actually helping the, the toe take you away, so... 
just just in case. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a very very good point. Um, and also, I think the seamist has been rolling in in Cornwall today. So um, yeah, yeah. another point there is if there's any any hint of a sea fog approaching you, if you're out in the water, um, I would suggest exit the water as quickly as yeah. possible, really. Because it's I, speaking from experience, I, I've been lost and ended up getting out quite a way away from where I actually thought I was. So yeah, yeah. Some, good, some good tips there. There's, there's plenty of information as well available on uh, websites which um, the three of us will pass on um, at a later stage of, of, of the webinar. Um, so let's just move on now. Let's say, um, Andy, you said you, you got your board and you just went straight in. Now you're coming from a pretty experienced surfing background, um, yeah. like myself. Do you think um, there's some essential key skills that people should possibly have or be working towards before entering into the surf um, as a stand-up paddleboarder? Um, yeah, I mean, when I first got mine, it was um, I was a surfer, so of course paddleboarding is easy because you know I'm a surfer and uh, jumped on it, and I was completely horrendous. <laughs> if I'm honest, I, it was such a big board and a paddle that I didn't know what to do with. Um, you know, most of the time when I was trying to turn the board to catch a wave, I'd fall off and I was getting really, uh, frustrated. So, um, you know, you come from a surfing background and think, oh, you know, I can surf, but it is a very different way of thinking, um, getting out as well. So getting out through the waves, you've got a paddle in one hand. So, and you've got your, um, board in your other hand, or you may have them both together, but still you've got two things to worry about instead of just one. So again, coming from surfing, you know, when you're getting out, you've got a lot more to think about. You've typically got a bit of a longer leash as well. So um, when you're getting out, right with surfing, you don't really want the board to get in between you and the wave, um, especially the bigger boards, because that's where the damage is usually done, is that the board has hit you with the wave, especially if it's quite a mellow wave. Um, so I think your balance and really learning on your board don't be a statue. That's like one of the biggest tips. Don't be a statue. Don't just keep your feet there and I can't do anything else. You know, you're going to have to move your feet slightly um, all the time because it's going to help you catch yeah. wave, but also getting over them. So if you're just okay. sitting there in your neutral position and the wave hits your nose, it's going to throw you forward. So we need to really be physically as mobile as we can. Yeah, Andy, um, I, I'm going to come on to some of that stuff a little bit oh, sorry. later as well. Oh, sorry, I skipped it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine. I didn't see the schedule, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was more so looking at, um, are there any drills? That, let, let's say a landlocked um, stand-up paddleboarder could uh, participate in to, to help, ah. them, help them when they actually hit the ocean. Um, any paddling drills? And Marie, you can chip into this one as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, go on, go on, Marie. <laughs> well, I think that obviously moving around on your board, particularly if you're on a longer board, is really important. Um, you know, when you're taking off on the wave, um, you need to get your weight quite far forwards to get the nose down the wave. Um, but then as soon as you're, you're picking up speed and, and you're actually, you know, gaining momentum, you want to step back. And so it's really important that your feet aren't glued to the board and that you feel, you know, um, you, you're used to moving your feet up and down the board um, you know obviously the shorter board the less far you'll have to go but the longer board you'll, you'll have to step back to get that nose disengaged and make sure it doesn't bury um, so yeah I mean on dry land you can actually practice um, doing some I mean you don't necessarily need to do the um, the long board um, I don't know what you call it actually I'm not a long boarder <laughs> <laughs> sidestep along the center line um but it does help that you you're not glued to the board and that you can move up and down in surf stance um so you you know you can practice that on a um inflatable surf or you can practice that on just an area which is um you know maybe a sort of unstable or a longer um a sort of low railing or you know along a bit of um uh, pavement and just practice stepping up and down and just keeping your feet on the center line um, other things obviously you need to be able to put your weight from front foot back, front foot to back foot um, really important especially you, know, you drive your board a lot with your legs so having strength in your legs and be able to get low um, in a 
in a standing position so a squat essentially is really important um, and from bunk back to front foot so uh, lunges um, you know are really good I would say for surfing um, to strengthen your legs and you know to feel happy moving from front leg to back leg. Okay what, what about some essential paddle strokes then um, would you say that we really should be having them dialed to a point before we're entering the surf? Step back turn, sweep strokes, any, anything like that? Um, do you think those are skills no, I mean, that need to be mastered? I mean, step backs are obviously really important um, in, most, in most parts of SUP, but again, with SUP surf, it is really important because if the wave comes in quick, um, bear in mind once you really get into the nitty gritty on a, on a point break and there's other surfers there, everything happens very, very quick. So you've just got to be on the mark. So again, step back turns are, I think, in anything you should be doing. I mean, even uh, if you just want to show off on the beach, um, the better you are at step back turns, the better you're going to be because you're also then getting in your, your foot positioning like you would be for surfing. So um, sometimes you can actually get from that step back turn, actually you're still in your surf stance and you're actually getting into the wave because you've turned very quick to catch it late. Um, and then obviously um, J stroke, C stroke type paddling, um, on the smaller volume boards, you, you're literally forever paddling to carry on going. And it's the same even on the bigger boards. You want to keep moving. So you don't always want to be moving forward. You might want to just be turning slightly um, to make sure in the, you're in the right position for when the ball comes up. So um, paddle techniques um, with turns, yeah, a definite, um, a definite yeah. plus. So, so in, uh, just speaking from my personal experience, um, paddling uh, on flat water and trying to help my surfing skills. I mean, as a summary, um, I find doing sprint starts, um, practicing those high cadence, getting the board moving um, because we're off the block, so to, see, so to speak, in the ocean when we see a wave. Um, we need to be able to have that skill to accelerate. And it's a very big ask to expect someone who's not used to reading how waves come in and what, what speed they're moving at. Um, the timing is critical. Um, so those of you who are beginning and getting into SUP surfing, that's something that you will most definitely be um, struggling with. But we, we can again recommend some videos for you to watch on that. Um, but also, like you say, moving around on the board and, and, and doing those turns, those step, step back turns are essential skills, really. If, if you can master those before you get into the water, into the surf zone, um, fantastic. So some top tips there, guys. Thanks for that. Let's move on to um, equipment and let's, let's, let's look at, and I can see you've got some boards in the background there, Andy, some of them looking really nice. Um, let's say, what, what's your advice for somebody coming into the SUP surfing scene um, and they're a beginner, um, not hardly any surfing experience, what kind, of, what kind of board would you be recommending that would be most appropriate? And, and let's talk about the leash as well, because um, that's a critical, critical thing. What's, what's your top tips? I mean, personally, um, I sort of went for a bit of an all-rounder because um, although I was, I sort of probably talked my, uh, my wife into letting me sort of buy the board um, by, you know, I'm going to take the kids and that on it. So um, something that's nice and stable that isn't just a headache to stand on because... Um, I see some people that come out, especially some of the places I surf, there's a lot of water moving over rocks and things like that. And they come out and they're just falling off one after, and it's just no fun. A wave comes, they fall off, you know. So something nice and stable. Um, the all-rounder staple size is like sort of 10, 6, 32 uh, by 32 wide. So something nice and wide. And also that 10 foot 6 is going to help you um, get into the wave a bit earlier uh, than the shorter boards. Um, you know, obviously you can surf an inflatable, um, hard boards realistically are much better in the surf. They're a lot more efficient, um, and they're not going to bend the same. You can get a lot more speed out of it, but it, it's getting a board, which is comfortable. Um, again, we, we all want to, I, I can remember going back to the surf days, everyone wants to walk down with a toothpick under their arm, but they're the guy who's paddling and getting frustrated. They can't catch anything. So, you know, <laughs> Bit, nice, nice bit of volume and uh, a nice bit of you know, width and length. So it's going to make it easier for you to start. 
Yeah, so we're, we're, we're looking at something maybe from 9.8, if it's got the width, up, up to 11.0. Um, any bigger than that, uh, 11.2, we're starting, starting to become a bit of a, bit of a hindrance, in, in my opinion. It's really hard to turn it quick, isn't it? So, you know. Yeah. So, um, Marie, um, you, have, you have a selection of boards there behind you as well, I think. Yeah, these are quite beginner boards, but um, I started off on a 9.8, which was 30 wide. Um, and then I soon progressed down to a nine foot, um, which, you know, just gave me, it just didn't seem quite so big and bulky. I think for smaller riders, you know, ladies perhaps that are smaller, um, you know, you can get away with something slightly smaller. And I think the bigger boards can sometimes put, you know, feel a little bit intimidating when you're a smaller person. So I would say that, you know, you could get away with, if it's got enough width, I think the width is the most important thing so that you don't, you know, like say you're not wobbling around when you're turning to catch that wave, you, you, you can get some decent paddle strokes in without, you know, feeling like you're going to fall off because you need a, you know, certain amount of stability to be able to put the power down um, to get that wave. Um, Otherwise, you're just going to be off. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to throw this one into the mix right now. Um, we have no doubt several audience members who don't actually possess hardboards and have inflatables, ISUPs. Now, we know out of choice that a hardboard would would perform, for the most part, significantly better and is much more appropriate in in the surf. There's obviously safety concerns associated with that. Um, with the wipeout procedures, um, a hardboard hitting you on the head is going to be hurting quite a lot more than, um, than an ISA. But in your opinion, Marie, can these people that own ISAPs, are they appropriate to take into the surf to learn to surf? I think you can learn. You know, technology has is, is, is got a lot you know, better so that um, inflatables are now pretty stiff. Um, they've made the rails um, narrower generally for, and, and still keeping the stiffness. Um, but, you know, there are clear disadvantages. You know, the, the hardboard will give you that definite rail that you can engage. And as you progress um, and you want to travel along the wave and start turning, um, then having a hard rail definitely helps. Um, you know, an inflatable just you know, isn't going to be quite the same. And I think for a beginner, it might just slow down your um, progression, I would say. Um, it's difficult. So, I mean, I, I have surfed inflatables. Um, I started off perhaps on an inflatable. Um, and, you know, it's, I think inflatables have come on a lot since then. Um, but, you know, as long as I think the main, um, uh, you know, you need to make sure that if you are going to use an inflatable, because some people that's all they've got, you certainly can take it in the waves, but it needs to be as stiff as it will go um, to be able to get the best performance out of it. <coughs> um, because otherwise, you know, as soon as you move on the board and if it's bending, um, you're going to lose that um you know, the efficiency of the board and, and, and it'll be enough to stop you from getting on the wave or nose bearing, <laughs> you know, burying the nose really because the board isn't going to react to you when you step back if it's, if it's soft. Yeah, so from, from my experience, um, again, rather like you, Andy, coming from a surfing background, picking up a sup board, going, can't be nothing to this, off we go. A very very humbling experience it was like learning and it was it was learning a completely new sport for me so not coming from a paddle background absolutely knew what to do once i was on the way well bar using the paddle didn't know what to yeah. do with that um but i could read the ocean so i had those i had that knowledge bank already um but i i actually started off on the hardboard and but i have surfed inflatable boards um and i'm reasonably competent i'd like to say um and i did find the key thing for me with an inflatable board was the nose diving aspect of it um, because these boards don't have as much rocker and for those of you who are not quite familiar with what that term means it means they're a lot flatter if you lay them on onto the floor than a traditional surfboard um, 
So it tended to be when I, when I could catch waves on the inflatable, I, I found that I really had to compensate and move much further back on the, towards the tail of the board, the back of the board, than I would have done on a hard board. Um, so for those of you that you know, don't have the endless budget, and that's quite a lot of us, um, unless we get our six numbers, we, we're not fortunate enough to go out and have lots of different kit. Um, ideally, if, if, you, if you have your hard board, I would say that's, that's uh, an equipment choice for me over an inflatable any time. But it doesn't mean to say that those of you with the ice ups cannot go into the water. By all means do, go in, practice. There's so much that you can learn using an inflatable board in a surf in a surf zone, which will also be considerably safer for reasons I've mentioned. Let's talk about leashes, Andy. Um, what kind of leash are we, are we expecting to use if we're sup surfing? Uh, well, in my eyes, coiled are obviously a bit of a no-no in the surf zone. Um, three, three basic reasons. You get the recall, so obviously anything that's coiled that goes out is gonna come springing back. Um, also, when it comes back, it tends to end up in a massive mess. Um, and they're a lot weaker. The you know, cord leashes are much weaker than straight leashes. So I would personally go for a straight leash, um, tend to go for um, probably a, a foot longer than my board, but it does depend where you're surfing. So some of the places I surf are very rocky. Uh, they're mostly reef breaks. So with a longer leash, there's always a good chance that if you wipe out, that board is going to end up uh, clattering the rocks and also in a busier surf zone you know that bigger leash you've got more uh you know you don't really want to be hitting people with it but um about sort of nine i mean longboard leashes will work um sub leashes tend to be about nine millimeter to ten millimeter thick so you know you want you want to make sure you've got a strong leash because again if your board if your leash snaps that board's going to go off straight towards everyone else trying to get out but also it's, it's probably our pride and joy which is going to end up um on something so at leashes are important and you know make sure you check them um because they can get damaged without you knowing and they can snap and when you feel a leash snap it's quite a, a heart-wrenching moment under the water when you feel the leash is gone and now it's the the fastest swim yeah so if we think i mean there are obviously sub specific leashes um yeah. which we know there's a, a a huge variety for all the different aspects Specifically for sup surfing, we recommend that you, you, like Andy said, you, you buy a leash which is specific to for a sup surfboard. It's going to be a don't put your normal surfboard leash on. It's just not going to have the thickness and the strength to be able to resist um, the forces from a, a 10, 10 foot board if that's what you're using. A couple of key points there that Andy said. Um, one is if you're using a 10 foot board, and Andy, you said. Uh, a leash maybe a foot longer than my board in certain circumstances. So if we add the two together, let's say an 11 foot leash and a 10 foot board, and you step away from step away from your board and stretch your leash as far as you can go, that's a big area that can wipe people out behind you um, if you should man if you should lose your board. So it's very very important. And Andy did mention checking your leashes. If you're carrying your board down the beach and your leash is dragging through the sand, that's just going to wear the velcro out. And you want to you want to periodically check check the uh, polyurethane for any nicks as well because it, it can be done. You putting it on the roof rack might get a little nick because um, the last thing you want to be doing is is um, having your board come through a coming into a swimming zone, for example, or towards somebody who who's behind you. So leashes are really really important bits of kit. Now, moving on, we get asked quite a lot. Um, when should I be wearing a P? A PFD. Should I be wearing a buoyancy aid in the surf? Now, come on, boys and girls, give us your answer to that one. I think I know what you're going to say. Well, personally, and it's not just coming from the surf background, but uh, no. No, because, I mean, trying to get under a wave. So if you haven't got your board um, and you've got rolling waves coming towards you and you're going to have to duck under them, the last thing you want is to make it harder for yourself to get under that wave because you're also going to get tow from the board. So you want to be able to swim under that, swim under that or duck under that wave as easy as possible. So uh, for me, for me, um, PFDs, I would say no. Okay. Yeah, I agree for the same reasons. Um, yeah. I mean, the only time that I, I have known people that 
aren't confident swimmers um, when they're progressing out in bigger surf just for um, peace of mind. They sometimes wear a waist uh, PFD um, that's an inflatable waist, uh, you know, so that if in the uh, situation that they lost their board, their leash snapped, um, yeah. then they would feel comfortable, um, you know, they could set off their PFD and, and, and float in. Yep. So I think I think the message here is, in most cases, we would we would absolutely say no. But I think it, you raised an important point there, Marie. So if someone is a little bit nervous, uh, not the strongest of swimmers. Hey, let's face it; they're not going to. They shouldn't be going out in big surf anyway. Um, potentially, that might be a, a reason that someone should be wearing a, a buoyancy aid. Um, but in general, you will see most. Most um, subsurfers will, will not be wearing um, a PFD. However, not to say that it, not to say that you won't see some wearing them. What about helmets? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, um, a lot of surfers don't wear helmets. Um, but if you're, if I mean, if you if you're thinking about the safety aspect, then obviously helmets are um, important, really, because if you're if you're knocked out it's sort of game over in a way. So, you know, if you had to wear any sort of safety protection uh, while you're out there, then helmets would be a key one. But unfortunately, no one's come around and made it really fashionable that um, everyone wants to wear one, which is uh, a bit of a pity because it doesn't really hinder you that much. Maybe on a hot day, you might get a bit hot or a weird tan. Um, I have worn one in the past because I um, hit my head on the rocks where I was surfing. And I've also had surfboards in the face as well, which the helmet wouldn't have helped me, but you know, it, things happen very quick. So if you're a little bit nervy and you've got a big board, then yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong with wearing a helmet. I think it's very <laughs> And to be honest, um, it's a personal choice, isn't it? You know, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the coming from the surfing world, um, very image conscientious, shall we say, most, uh, yeah. most surfers. Um, Absolutely, when these guys are surfing these uh, waves that are over breaking over you know, very shallow coral reefs, um, we've we've had helmets. Helmets have been um, available for a, quite a long time. So, if you have one and it makes you feel more comfortable, if you're nervous, um, absolutely go there. That, that I would I would suggest wearing that. So we talked about beginner boards. Um, ideally, you know, a, a ten. 10.0, 10.5, width is important. Marie, you mentioned for, for the uh, smaller or lighter people, maybe we can come down a bit in size uh, as long as there's the stability with the width. Um, we've talked about leashes and a little bit about the beach safety. What we haven't mentioned now, is, or what we haven't mentioned yet, and I'd like to mention now, is what, what about the paddles? Are we, are we okay to use anything? What's your top tips with paddles and, and paddle length for surfing? Not at the angle of a very experienced um, sub surfer, Andy, but as a beginner, any top tips for paddle choice and paddle length? Uh, well, I suppose it, it comes down to budget and choice, isn't it? At the end of the day, because I mean, carbon pad, you know, carbon fixed paddle is obviously you know the the the, the most ideal thing for the um, for sub surfing, like it is for every literally every part of uh, of the sub world, but um, once you've cut it, you know, I mean, you typically have them slightly shorter for surfing because you want to be able to get closer to the wave. Uh, you're going to be on a lower volume board. Um, but I mean, if, if that's the paddle you've got, you've just got an aluminium paddle, then, you know, yeah, use it. Maybe shorten it slightly so you can get uh, your legs a bit more involved while you're trying to get into the wave. But it does come down to budget. Unfortunately, if I, if I use aluminium paddles, I tend to bend them because uh, they usually got massive blades and they're not strong enough. So if you could step up a little bit, um, it would definitely help. And you're going to get more power to get into the waves as well. For me personally, um, I, I'm fortunate enough to do a little bit of traveling and I do travel with surfboards and sub surfboards. Um, having an adjustable paddle, uh, I think is a godsend for traveling um, when I can't bring all of my kit with me. And, and it means that I can use it if I'm just doing a little bit of adventuring on my 10.5, just cruising up and down a river. If I want to sup surf, I can shorten it a little bit to, to take, take into account my stance is going to be more crouched uh, and lower. 
So it's really, really, uh, really, really good, good thing to have as a, a, an adjustable paddle. What about blade size or anything like that, Andy, without getting too technical? Just um, big blade, small blade? Yeah, I mean, I think bigger blades were the, were the thing. I mean, it's a very personal thing, a paddle, because like I'm 105 kilos and 6'3", so I'll be someone who's 80 kilos and sort of uh, 5'10 or something is going gonna, gonna to need a different paddle, really. Um, but sup surfing, you tend to have something that's slightly smaller, a little bit quicker cadence, um, in because you sort of it's a very it's a very quick explosive start, so you want to get things moving and you want to get those legs pumping to pump the board in. Um, but I, I may use one slightly bigger because if I'm doing laybacks and that sort of thing, I like a bigger platform to sort of lean into. So um, it's a case of trial and error, but usually slightly smaller. But you know, not everyone can afford um, you know, lots of different paddles for different occasions. Okay. So uh, let's, let's, let's move on. I'm conscious of time. Um, so we've done the safety, we've done the kit. Um, we've arrived down the beach. It's a beautiful sunny day. The, the waves are breaking gently in, in reasonable deep water. They're not crashing on the shoreline. The lifeguards are down on the beach. Um, flags, for those who are not aware of them, areas that we uh, should definitely not be entering into the water. Marie, if you, if you come in on, on this one for us. Um, definitely not if there's a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the flags are broken up into, uh, well, generally surf zone, uh, which is, it's been so long since I've seen this up, black and white. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> and then red and white for the swimmer zone. Um, so obviously as surfers, you want to stay out of the swimming zone. Um, and if you if you end up finding yourself in the swimming zone, you normally get um, uh, you know shouted at or whistled at or or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you need to check the beach. Um, and if you're unsure, you know if you can't remember like like me, you get your flags modelled up or you're colour blind, then just go and ask the lifeguards. You know they're always really helpful, and they you know it's their um, you know they're keen to just keep everyone safe on the water so um you know just i've often if i'm at an unfamiliar venue i i often have a chat with the lifeguards and um you know just ask their opinion about where i should go you know what the hazards are um um you know just to, just for sort of peace of mind really um you know and they're always happy to help yeah so Absolutely essential there. Um, red and yellow flags for the swimming area. <laughs> <laughs> so we must avoid those. Use your lifeguards. Um, hopefully they will be back on our beaches um, soon. I, I really, really hope we see them back patrolling. Um, the black and white check flags marks out an area for um, surf craft. So that could be kayaks, surfboards, stand up paddle boarders. And in my experience, uh, in a lot of beaches now, the black and white flagged area is busier than the red and yellow swimming area so if you think that it's too busy lay move away to a different beach or choose a different day if you're if you're learning um there's there's plenty of choice where i i live um i'm quite lucky in that in that aspect but come for someone like marie if, if it's a really really busy day at bantam possibly not too many other places to choose so let's um let's talk about um how, how do these people, uh, be, our beginners now, what should they be thinking about entering into the water, carrying the board and some, let's say, top three tips of how to, how to get out. Are they going to jump straight on standing up and paddle or would you suggest walking out, uh, knees? What's your top three top tips, Marie, on how to get out? And when we say get out, what do we mean by get out? Get out where? Where, where should they be aiming for? <laughs> so you're going to get the cleanest waves um, out the back um, and that's where you want to aim for. So that's basically past the breaking section, um, which is generally, well, depending on how big it is um, and the sort of type of beach break that there is, you know, you'll have to paddle over a few white sections before you hit the, the sort of surf, surfable waves or the cleaner waves out, out what we call out the back. Um, so, you know, first of all, you want to make sure that you, you've got your leash on, but don't put it on until you get right to the water's edge, because obviously you can trip yourself up and, and, and that doesn't look really cool. Um, and, um, you know, then you want to launch, you want to basically walk your 
bored out um, into, I would say, about, you know, thigh depth um, water, knee depth, thigh depth water. Um, and then, you know, as soon as possible, um, get to your feet. And you want to um, make sure that you're pointing the board directly or perpendicular, you know, right angles to the waves, because as soon as you um, come side onto the wave, um, then it's going to wash you back in. Um, so yeah, get the nose of the board pointing um, into the wave. Um, and the paddle, I mean, at first, I think the, the paddle is the main issue you worry about. Are you going to lose your paddle? Um, and basically, you want the paddle to be on the board, resting on the board, and you're going to have your board next to you. And ideally, on the side, that just feels most comfortable. You've got most control out, out of the board. And, you know, I'm right-handed, for example, so I always have my board on the right-hand side. I just find that I've got more control over it. And you're going to hold... Um, the board at the front and the back and have the paddle um, with the handle facing into the wave <clears throat> because the, the, the paddle can actually, you know, the blade, if it's pointing into the wave, can actually catch, catch the wave and then just come back at you um, as well as the nose of the board. So, so, so sorry, Marie, I think that's a really important thing um, that we teach um, in our school is we actually get people to stand in waist, waist depth water with, with their board and their paddle um, alongside them and just get used to being able to manage that board in the white water zone by, by pushing down on the tail to lift yeah. the front, the nose of the board up as the white water approaches. Now you don't want to get to the point where you push too far down on the tail and the, and the board almost rises up. Um, and it's hit by the white waves, by the white water, and it becomes vertical in the air and becomes a flying object. Um, so it's a bit of a skill, but it's an essential skill, I think, in, in, in um, managing white water, because we're all going to experience it, and we're all going to end up in the white water, whether we're, irrespective of whether we're experienced subsurfers or we're not. So that, what, a good top tip there. Um, Andy, can I bring you in a minute? Um, so let's say we've managed, we've managed uh, to negotiate the whitewater by standing there and now we're ready to go. Where should we be aiming? Should we be jumping on our knees, do you think? Um, and if we're jumping on our knees, is there any top tips for paddling? And what happens if we get our timing a little bit wrong and a wave, a whitewater wave is rolling towards us? What, what can we do to prevent, um, you know, let's say, pre well, stop us wiping out, really. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. What's your top tips? Yeah, so I mean, typically you, you tend to go um, on your knees. You want to be, um, if we use the, the carry handle is like the sort of center. So you want to be a little bit further back than that because you want to be able to lean to get your nose over. So obviously hold your paddle shorter, short paddle strokes. Um, and when the wave comes, we lean back to get that nose up or we want to get the nose up or through the wave as much as we can. Um, again, if we don't hit the wave square on, you know, so if we're not hitting, so if the wave's coming in, if we're not hitting it square, we're hitting on the side, it's going to tip us off. Um, um, I would <coughs> tend to start to get over and start to get a bit of momentum up. Um, and I mean, mean sorry, sorry, yeah. Andy, you mean you get a bit of momentum up before that white water gets anywhere? Yeah, yeah. So, report. so trying to get a bit of speed before the white water hits you because you're going to see it's going to be much easier to get up and over it um and again that is very key is keeping that speed going don't once we stop paddling we tend to sort of drift around um and we can get caught sort of side on so we want to keep positive keep keep the speed going up over the wave so we attack the wave so we attack the top of the white water and as we go we start paddling again but always bear in mind keep looking ahead to see what's happening in front of you um, yeah, and I think also bear in mind keep looking behind you as well to make sure that someone hasn't sneaked up behind you, because um, should you should you get your timing wrong or you do get wiped wiped out, um, you got your ten foot board and your eleven foot leash. <laughs> so if yeah, anyone's twenty one yeah. in a radius of twenty one foot behind you, this yeah. is why it's very key to choose a choose a beach or a break which is not busy while you're learning this. So what about, what about the paddle and reaching over? As we, as we say, lean back a little bit, we've, we've got a bit of speed, we're trying to punch through the white water. And bear in mind, this should not be bigger than waist height while we're learning. Um, can, can, we, can we reach over with a paddle to dig it in behind the wave as well? Do you think that's a, 
Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I usually sort of say that when we're going into it, as the wave comes, we obviously want to put a good paddle stroke in as we lean back, because we can really push up and over. And then as we're coming over, then we can actually get our paddle straight back in again um, to stabilize. Because obviously, when we go over, a lot of stuff can can happen. So. Uh, yeah, and I, I always find I always find that paddling on my strongest side just before the wave, well, a good time before the waves hit me to build up that speed is great to and to make sure that I'm straight. What we don't want to be doing is swapping sides um, just as um, the wave's going to hit us, really. So a good drill, maybe, is on your knees and practicing. See if you can paddle, I don't know, over 15 meters, 20 meters, maybe, on one side powerfully and flash, uh, fast and explosive. Yeah. Okay, so knees, absolutely recommend going out on your knees, unless if you want to try standing up and paddling out straight away with no experience. Just speaking from experience, that is going to be quite humbling. But what do we do now then? So we got out on our knees. Um, could, should, would you guys recommend let's stay in the whitewater zone and possibly let's see how it feels to catch a wave? Um, for many people, this might be the first time they've ever caught a wave on the knees. So do you think that's a good thing to possibly think about? Catching a whitewater wave on your knees? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's... A white water okay. wave is, is not going to be as powerful. Um, it's also not going to be as steep. So just to get that feeling of the wave picking up, because obviously when the wave picks you up, you're going to have to try and um, move your weight further back so you don't bury the nose in. So, uh, I mean, obviously, we all aim to you know get those green waves and carve across and that. But at the start, you know, we, we don't really want to be putting ourselves in as much danger or making it really hard for ourselves. So yeah, I mean, you know, a white water wave, there's nothing wrong with catching that. Just getting yeah. used to the deal, going through those drills, you know, the, the paddling, the catching, the leaning back, um, you'll yep. soon then start to feel it. So some top tips that I, I, I would like to just introduce there is, um, if, you, if you're going out through the white water, do as Andy said, give it your best shot. Um, you've got to turn your board around. So here's where a turning stroke is essential. If you allow yourself enough time to turn your board before the white water actually gets to you, keep your board pointing straight towards the shore. Um, build up a little bit of speed, maybe, with some paddle strokes when, when the wave is possibly two, three meters away um, from, your, from the tail of your surfboard. Well, we use an analogy, like for those of you who are driving, we're filtering into a motorway um, traffic. So you want to kind of build up same similar kind of speed as the wave moving towards you. It takes quite a bit of time to read waves. And, and then just go and catch, I don't know, five, ten waves maybe on your knees. What are the guys going to do? What are they going to do with a paddle, Marie, uh, at this stage? Uh, should we be focusing on them using their paddle at this stage? Or what's your thoughts on that? Once they're on the wave, I'm talking about. When you're on your knees? Yeah. Should we be trying to dig the paddle in as, as we're going towards the shore or what, 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 what advice would you would you say? I, I would say you need to keep your paddle out um, because if you stick your blade in as you're going fast forwards it's going to pull you off. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to think about isn't there? I mean for those people who, or, for those uh, people who haven't... Um, yeah or, or it's going to result in, in you you know pulling your shoulder or you know um, or you know the force of the water hitting the board when you're going at uh, hitting the blade when you're going at speed is either going to result in knocking you off um, or you might end up losing your paddle because it's you know it's actually quite a force um, uh, against the blade and pulling it out of your hand but um, yeah no you need to keep it up above the water but actually close to the water because you can actually use it as a brace um, to you know if you do have a wobble and find yourself going overboard then you can kind of use the blade to sort of push you back up again but you need to make sure that it's not going to dig in so it needs to be you know flat um yep. over the water so some top tips there um I, I would also just add to that that spend time in the white water get if you're not used to surfing if you don't come from that surfing background learning how the board moves, how it accelerates, how it slows down, just with small adjustments in your knee position. Another top tip, get off before your fin hits the sand. You don't win any awards for riding right up the beach. 
fins are expensive, so you need to be getting off and at least knee depth water. And the inevitable wipeout for those of, I'm sure most of our listeners know what that means, but if you're falling off and you're not wearing your helmet, then hey, let's cover our heads. That's, that's the engine room, that's where most of the computers are based, and let's protect our heads. So paddles for the main start will float, but your head, you know, is, is a critical part of your body. So you want to protect the back of your neck and the front of your face. And when you come up, surface, locate your board, retrieve it as quickly as possible. Hopefully you're going to be in waist to chest depth water and do that drill that we said about compose yourself and standing with the board beside you, keeping it straight and familiarization. This is not something that is going to all click in one session unless you're very, very lucky. It's practice and repetition. What I was going to no. say as well, sorry, Chris, uh, just, just on the wipeout side of things, that um, obviously when you come up, obviously you need to know where your board is, but also you've got to make sure what other waves are coming your way. Uh, that's one thing I've noticed with some people not as experienced is they're sort of looking for their boards and don't realise they're going to get absolutely hammered because, or I mean it's absolutely hammered, it's not a massive wave, but they, they haven't sort of looked out to see that there's a bit of a set wave coming. So... Um, Definitely when you come up, see where your board is, but then see what else is coming behind you. It's not always um, advisable, is it, to just go for it uh, and paddle relentlessly. Sometimes we have to stop and assess, just like you're saying, and right, is it good for me to go now? So waves, waves are not continuous. They come in what we call sets, a series of waves. Um, and then there is a period called a lull where there are no waves. Um, and maybe that's a better opportunity for you to, to paddle um, when you think there's one of these lull periods. Um, so moving on, we've caught some waves on our knees. We, we've, have, we've started to experiment with using the paddle a little bit. Um, we've had some top safety tips. Don't ride in too far. Cover your head if you're going to wipe out. Now, my, my suggestion would be for those of you now that uh, are comfortable to move on is catch a wave on your um, knees but as you're now moving forward to the beach, attempt to stand up. Now, what do we need to know about stance, Andy? What does, what does surf stance mean to those people that don't know what it, <laughs> what it actually is? So basically, we're going to have one foot in front of the other foot. So we're all born a certain way and stand a certain way. So um, some people prefer to and can balance better with their right foot forwards. And you're called, that's called a goofy stance. And then some people would prefer to have a left foot for, uh, their left foot forwards and they call that a regular stance. So it's obviously important to understand um, which way you favour, which way feels more comfortable. Um, so then when we get up, we can actually get that, whichever our lead leg, whichever leg we prefer to lead with, is getting in front of us. Um, and then our back leg then will start to come back. So... Um, like riding a skateboard or anything like that, you don't sort of ride with sort of two feet neutral. So as you come off your knees, you sort of then start to migrate one further forwards. Now you can actually lean forwards or lean back. If you're going to nosedive, you can lean back um, much easier once you're actually in that surf stance. So one foot a lot more engaged than the other one. Key point here, Andy. Uh, which ankle does the leash go on then? So the leash will always go on your back leg. Um, so again, it's really important before we go on the water to find out, are we goofy or are we regular? Um, the last thing you want is the leash on your front leg or your leading leg, because now you've got the leash basically around both your legs. Yeah. So for those, of, those people who are coming from a uh, snowboarding or skateboarding background, um, that they will probably have that dialed. Um, if you're unsure, I mean, some people are skillful enough to surf both ways with their left foot forward on one wave and then reverse right foot on the other wave. Um, personally, me, I'm a goofy foot, so I surf with my right foot at the front. If you're unsure, maybe a little drill you can do is just practice jumping up into what you think is a surf stance on the beach and see which leading leg or, or kneeling up and to standing and seeing which leading leg feels more comfortable with, for you. It's a top tip, though, with the leashes um, because of the entanglement issues and moving around. Um, okay, so we're, we're standing, we're moving, our, we're moving our weight around. We've got a few little other things to think about if we're standing and wiping out now. We don't want to be diving headfirst off into shallow water. How, 
Marie, how, how, how do you explain for our novices what's a safe way to fall? Where, where should we be falling away from? Well, I just gave the answer away there. How should we fall off our support? <laughs> Um, you want to keep hold of the paddle and um, obviously fall away from the board. Um, and, you know, I would suggest falling flat if you can, rather than going, you know, feet first or um, head first. Yeah. So, what never... pancake style. <laughs> <laughs> so, never, never in front of the board for obvious reasons. Yeah. And pref preferably to the side. And, and for those of you that are acrobatic divers, we, we, we certainly don't want to be diving headfirst into shallow water. So for, as Marie says, fall flat um, and then retrieve your board as quickly as possible. Now, we're standing up. We've done some wipeouts. We're ready to adventure further out. In the surfing world, the terminology is out back. Um, what do we, when, when we say out back, Marie, and positioning, what, what, what's some top tips um, for people that are ready now to venture a little bit further out to where the waves are actually breaking first of all? Positioning. Um, so obviously if you go too far out the back and the waves aren't, aren't breaking, then you're gonna find it extremely hard to pick up a wave. Um, so you wanna come far enough forwards that you're just, you know, the wave, uh, is, is just gonna break, if that makes sense. Um, um, and also, you need to sort of position yourself so that um, as the wave, or you wanna really get on the wave just before it breaks, ideally. Um, so it takes a little bit of practice to, to, to work out which, you know, where to be um, and, you know, depending on the sort of set, as it were, it might break further further in or it might break further out. So you need to always keep a lookout on the horizon. And, you know, you'll get used to seeing, you know, the more you, you go out in the surf, you'll get used to seeing um, the sets and the waves come in and, and, and you get better at predicting, you know, whereabouts they're gonna, where you need to be um, in relation to that breaking, that breaking wave. Um, so, um, you know, you want to be getting on the wave as you're facing into the beach. Um, but as you know, when you pad you're going to be sort of paddling on one side and turning um, as the wave is approaching you. So you need to make sure that actually you start paddling um, for the wave as it's pretty much side on to you. I think Andy's probably better at explaining this because he teaches this all the time. Um, yeah, over to you, Andy. Give us some top, give us some of your top tips then. Well, you know, one one thing I wanted to ask is when when you are out out in this wonderful area known as Outback, um, are you sitting on your board waiting? Are you on your knees? Are you standing up all the time? Um, are you are you paddling? You you did mention earlier in 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 the webinar that you were you were continuously paddling. Now I'm sure that's possibly to do with the kit that you're using. It's been so. Um, so performance orientated that you need to keep moving for the stability. Um, but for those of us that are riding, I don't know, a much more stable board, um, are we paddling parallel to the shore so that we only then have to turn through 90 degrees if we see a, a wave coming? What, what's your top tips? Yeah, so um, again, once we're, we're out back, um, so I suppose it's, it's a safer zone because obviously um, the waves aren't going to break, break and hit us. We, we want to keep parallel, but I... Um, especially on a beach break where um, beginners are going to aim to go, I typically would be going up and down and to keep moving. A um, couple of reasons, obviously, one, you keep balance, but waves don't always break the same place every single time. So if we keep moving and keep looking out at what's coming in, um, we can actually see something and get ourselves ready ahead of time before that wave. So again, if we are parallel, uh, to where the waves, we don't have to turn, we don't have to do such a step back turn, we don't have to do a 180, we can just do a 90 and paddle into it, making sure um, that as the wave's coming, we're getting our paddle on our favourite side to get in, because it's much easier uh, once you start getting to that surf stance, you can now start pumping the leg to get in. So positioning, um, definitely going 
parallel with the with the waves and and really study the waves when they're coming in you know i suppose most people can learn a lot from surfing just from sitting on the beach having a look out because certain places they will break uh, more than others depending on what the bottom of the uh the break is like so definitely yeah, yeah. um stay stay loose stay stay nimble you know because you could be just on the the edge well i think i i'm very mindful of timing here it's a uh, it's flown away this this is a subject that i think we need to expand on and run another session um on the next on the ne next level and, and we can introduce our videos that we we intended to to use today but we've got a bit of a technical hitch with that one so for all of our listeners um we, we will aim to put another session on, I think, what next? And we, we can put all this into um, a, a webinar where we can show you the videos. It's hard to talk about these things. Visually, we need, it's so much easier to uh, learn when you can see a visual. Um, one thing I, I, I want to say is, um, let's just briefly talk about etiquette, surfing etiquette, the do's and the don'ts. Um, and I'm afraid we'll probably have to wrap, wrap the session up there. Um, some, some of you guys are asking technical questions as well as what board is appropriate for me. I, I'm of a certain weight. What I would ask you um, there is um, we don't have enough time to answer that question right now. Could you email um, those to us to info at Water Skills Academy and we'll get back to you within 24 hours with the answers and our advice. But let's just quickly uh, talk about surfing etiquette, Andy. Do's and don'ts. Um, yeah, so uh, surfing etiquette is whoever is at the, I mean, where the wave starts to break, usually whoever is there or the closest to it has pr what they call priority. Now, there's no laws for that. It's just something that we all try to abide by to, I suppose, stop uh, each other throttling each other to whose wave they are. Um, so, again, we want to stay away from crowds. So we're not really, um, hopefully we're not with too many people, but you've got to obviously when a wave starts to sort of come and peak up whoever's in that center line is more likely to be uh, is has got priority so then um if you're not on that point then you need to let them go if you start catching waves that other people have priority to you are not going to make friends in the, in the surf zone for sure and also it's a it's a it's a pretty dangerous place as well because you're going to have someone coming in at the same angle so, um, you know, there'll be more, more collisions. So it's, it's abiding to it, but also, you know, if you're in the zone, you don't have to let other people have it. If you, if that's your priority, you should uh, go and take it. It's, it's the, in our surfing world, it's known as the drop in, isn't it? Which is yeah. the ultimate sin. So basically that's catching a wave where somebody's already up and riding. So some top tips there would be look left and look right. Um, make sure that no one else is on the wave. Um, can be quite frustrating as well because um, you will see the guys and girls that are quite proficient seem to be catching all the waves all the time now that's something that they've learned um, and put the time in um, you know we'd like to think that attitudes are friendly and you know everyone's got to learn at some point you know and um, we, we really 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 need to be mindful of that um, so I, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up because um, Andy and Marie will know that I'm I'm fortunate enough to do off to a little bit of fishing now that uh, I've got a, got some guys waiting for me chomping at the bit. Um, hey, where's my ticket? <laughs> <laughs> I think what we'll do, I think what we'll do is, uh, and I apologise to all of our, our, our listeners if um, I'm cutting this short. Um, we'll put on another webinar, I think, on sup surfing, and we'll we'll summarise a lot of the stuff that we've talked about using our videos. Um, for those people that uh, are attending our SUP symposium in October, Andy, myself, and Marie, we will be there in one of the workshops. Um, we'll be SUP surfing, surfing permitted, uh, or surf permitted. It's, it's on Hailing Island in October, so we don't need much surf. We just need a little bit of wind swell. We can, there's so much to learn that we can teach you. So we would love to see you um, in Hailing Island in, in October. Um, I'd like to say thanks very much, Andy uh, and Marie. Um, for giving, giving your time up again. Um, we'll be in touch and we'll, we'll put another session on um, pretty soon, I think. Next Wednesday, we've got a development session with uh, Steve West. For those of you who are interested, that's um, talking about the forward stroke, the, three, the first three phases. That'll be very, very, very informative. Uh, for those of you who don't know Steve, um, he's pretty much considered to be a bit of a guru in the stand-up paddleboarding world. 
So I most certainly will be um, tuning into that one. So that's available on our website. So stay safe, everyone. Um, sorry, it hasn't been too much of a Q&A session from you guys. Um, we've we've um, kind of really run over time on this one, but it, hopefully you found, you've got some useful tips there and we'll, we will um, put another one on possibly next Friday. So look out for that. So thanks ever so much. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Marie. Cheers, Amy. Stay safe. Cheers, guys. Stay yeah. safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.